You're listening to This Week in E-Commerce, the Ecom Nation podcast. Dive into the top online retail headlines with your hosts, Paul Waddy and Mal Chia. Let's load up the cart. This Week in E-Commerce, episode 31. I am Mal Chia and joining me this week is Arabella Clare, head of e-commerce projects at Ecom Nation. Arabella, welcome to the show. Thank you. Long time listener, first time participant. Very exciting. Mm-hmm. Long time, first time, as they call it. So Arabella <laughs> is stepping in for Paul. Paul is currently on a flight and we weren't able to arrange another time. So Arabella has kindly stepped in uh, to, to, to to add an extra dimension to the show this week, which I'm really looking forward to. <laughs> to talking to I will someone do my different. best. I will do my best Paul, <laughs> Yeah, to, to sub in. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, Arabella, speaking of not, not really subbing in, but, um, but Retail Fest is coming up and, and you are going to be doing quite a few things there. So uh, you're going to be doing a workshop. (laughs) Yeah. So what are you going to be doing at Retail Fest? Um, I'm going to be doing a workshop uh, with Klaviyo and SearchSpring um, all around hyper-personalization. So I'm uh, spearheading the e-commerce side of things and uh, then passing it over to Klaviyo and SearchSpring to talk about how their platforms are really great with um, hyper-personalization. Fantastic. How they're helping businesses in that area. So it's really exciting. Very new kind of space that's obviously emerging. So much has been done on it recently. So, yeah, looking forward to having a chat to everyone, hopefully yeah. embarking some knowledge. That's great. <laughs> Look, I think in this space as well, like you said before, there is so much tech currently in there. There's so much tech investment, um, whether you're mm-hmm. talking about SearchSpring or, or Klaviyo, like you said before, and how those platforms work together. And, you know, and you can see so clearly like what happens when you create that personalized experience for for customers and you would have seen oh, yeah. a lot of this with uh with a lot of the brands who you've worked with before yeah definitely i mean there's some statistic which i'm pulling absolutely directly from my presentation but i think it's something like over 75 percent of pers- uh, of customers who have a personalized experience will shop again with that business so hmm. um and that is only going to be growing as people kind of understand the power of hyper personalization so so, yeah, some really exciting, exciting things happening in that space. That's really kind of marrying the online and offline environments in particular. So, yeah. And I'm not sure if I've told you yet, but you're also going to be doing some live audits. <laughs> you haven't I, told I, me yet. I don't think I I've told you that yet. I love that you've waited until the webinar <laughs> to the podcast to tell me this. It, it's on the pod now, so it's official. <laughs> um, but, yes, you, I, I did dub you in to do some live audits, which means that – Amazing. Merchants at Retail Fest um, will be able to bring you their website and on stage you'll be able to critique it live and give them live feedback in terms of how they should improve. It's a lot of fun. I've done it the last two years. Oh, okay. I'll, 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 be, I'll try and be kind yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe cruelly be kind. Well, actually, do you know what? My, my big tip from that is that they don't want you to be kind. Otherwise, they wouldn't have brought you their website. So uh, I, I, was quite, um, I was quite blunt with it. But really my feedback was always the same like, What's your brand? What's your story? And it's amazing how many websites there are where you landed it and you don't know why this brand exists, particularly if they're selling something which doesn't actually have a unique, you know, which isn't unique to the market, which let's face it, 95% of products out there aren't unique. You need to tell them why you exist. Yeah. I had a, um, a good tip from an old mentor, which is if you cover someone's logo on the website, can you still tell what brand it is? Hmm. So it's a good, good little test. For Absolutely, people I love that. Mind, I love that one. Yeah. I actually did that once where I took, um, I took the mission statement of all our competitors when I was working in another brand, and we put them side by side. And I asked the team, like, who should have known our mission statement? And a team of like the brand mark or like the marketing team put them all up side by side, and no one, not even the CEO, could tell the difference between each one. And it's like you didn't even know your, our mission <laughs> it's statement. Pretty damning evidence. It was pretty damning evidence. Like they're all exactly the same. It's like great. Because everyone in our category says the exact same shit. So what are we going to do, which is actually going to be different? Because it's not our mission statement. It's got to be everything else. It's true. So, Very good. And also next week before Retail Fest, I will be doing the how to build a strategy. I can't actually remember what the full title is. So Sanchi will probably um, crucify me for the fact that I can't got, remember There's so much going on. <laughs> <laughs> but I am going to be doing a strategic planning workshop in a couple of weeks' time. So we did have to move the date because I'm, I'm, I'm going to be in Byron on Thursday filming a section with, uh, with Clavio. Um, so uh, we have moved that to next Thursday, the following week. I'm going to be going through a workshop to teach everyone how to create a really effective e-commerce strategy. So that's going to be a bit of fun leading into 
to Retail Fest, where I'm going to be doing a half day workshop on day one of Retail Fest, which is going to be about how to build a killer marketing strategy. So that's, I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, so there's going to be a lot going on over that period with some fantastic brands also coming along and joining us there. All right, Arabella, we are now going to get into the main part of the episode, which is we've got some stories to talk about. And the first story is a really a bit of a, a two for one in that there's a couple of articles which I read in the last week, um, which most people, if you're watching the news, probably would have seen as well, um, which I feel are a bit of two sides of the same coin, effectively, where number one, we've kind of got the RBA, which is holding the cash rates and interest rates for another month, which is... Um, Good news that it's not continued to go up, but bad news in that we're holding it at an all-time high. And secondly, the other article is that insolvencies in Australia have jumped to, by, um, to a decade-long high last month with 974 businesses falling into insolvency, which is quite a significant number. Uh, and this is also off the back of like not even a couple of weeks ago, we spoke about Tiger Lily falling into yeah. administration as well, as well as other brands like Godfrey's early this year going into administration, no one taking them out of administration. So they are just going to close. So we're seeing a big jump in that. So obviously not super positive signs for the retail sector um, at the moment. What do you, what do you make of this? Like, what are you thinking about this at the moment, Arabella? I mean, it seems that they just made a decision to not make a decision, yeah. to be honest. <laughs> um, yeah, look, uh, it's at an all-time high. I think uh, you're absolutely right um, that it, it's two sides of the same coin. And I think it's also a bit of a catch-22 as well. I think obviously they're waiting for some kind of signal in the market to change their minds and the market's kind of waiting for a signal from them. Um, so... Yeah, it's a really tricky situation. It's um, in terms of the retail kind of a lot of businesses facing insolvency and um, and things. It does remind me a little bit of that retail apocalypse that we went through about two years before COVID, um, which was largely around kind of a lot of businesses not concentrating enough on online. Um, I think this time, I'm, I'm not sure about your kind of thoughts on this, Mal, but potentially we're seeing a bit of a hangover from COVID, the glory days of COVID, maybe people over buying in inventory and not being able to sell it because of the cost of living crisis. Um, so yeah, it's really, it's really sad. I'd, lo I'd lo love to know, but oh, I'd be not love to know. I'd be interested to know what the split is between the online, pure play online and omni channel versus you know, um, physical retailers who are going under, but, but yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah, I think well, ASIC haven't really released the, inf um, the information about which what those numbers look like between mm. uh, pure players, but even what type of businesses they are. They just said that is nine hundred, so nine hundred eighteen, so nine hundred and eighteen businesses. Uh, wait, yeah, wow. Right? No, nine nine hundred sixty seven businesses in February, uh, which went into insolvency. So they haven't actually said what the split was, but clearly we saw a lot of brands, like I said, Tiger Lily before, yeah. um, Alice McCall in the last twelve months, Nick Kinsu Brands, Godfrey's, like we said before. So lots of brands going into administration, regardless of whether they're pure play or you know or, or, or omni channel or even just like pure bricks and mortar. And I think you made a really good point before that you, there were the glory days, a lot of people going out buying a lot of stock, being very bullish. About about what the future hold, held and now being kind of left holding the bag as demand has very quickly fallen away from that and when you look at what the RBA is trying to do obviously they're trying to they're trying to not let prices spiral out of control they're trying to keep a lid on um, on 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 inflation um, but by doing so they're keeping interest rates really high but when but the businesses are then suffering for that because that then dampens consumer demand and as consumer demand is dampening people are spending less people are going out less people have less discretionary income which means that if your business isn't essential you are suddenly at risk like Woolworths and Coles are never going to go out of business because they sell essentials but at if a really high luxury, price <laughs> at a really high price <laughs> but if you're luxury fashion perhaps less so right so people are going to be much more discerning about whether they're going to buy from you and you're seeing with all these businesses who for whatever reason whether they weren't able to get the positioning right or whether they're just yeah. in a cash crunch they just, they just don't have the free cash flow to support it they're now in a position where they can't continue on anymore. So I, I, I got to think like this is probably not going to slow down anytime soon while inflation remains high, while the cash rate remains at its current rate, that we're not going to see this go down. Like we're probably going to see this if 
either stay at this level of that 967 businesses going into solvency every month or potentially looking at rising you know, yeah. as well. Like, what, what do you think? What, what do you think is going to be the likely outcome? I mean, I think you're right. I think it's around that mid. It's really tough for those middle market re- retailers at the moment who are neither that kind of value discount driven um, or an established value discount driven brand. And they haven't nutted out, I guess, how to put across their value proposi- proposition in terms of why they you should pay the price that they're asking for. I think they're going to be suffering the most. And unfortunately, it's not really an overnight fix for that kind of mm. stuff. It really needs you really need to have a good strategy in place and have been doing it for for a period of time. And if yeah, if you've been relying on just kind of a couple of sales here and there, it's not going to be enough to cut it anymore, I don't think. Um, mm. um fortunately, I think a lot of businesses are in the same boat, which is really unfortunate. And I think there's um, a stat which was quoted uh, in this article from Paul Zara, who was saying that uh, January retail sales outpaced December trading by 1.1%. But the thing, sorry, Rob Godwin from the NRA said that. Uh, I think one thing which Rob didn't mention in that number, though, was what actually contributed to that increase, that that 1.1% increase was through um, through different categories. So particularly like an mm. increase in spending on food, um, whereas apparel actually saw a decrease in spending in there. So that's something where, yes, it's as a whole, it's grown, but only in certain sectors. Yeah. And I think yeah. I, I, I heard Paul say last time or in a couple of episodes ago that I'm not quite sure why food and hospitality are in that in the same. Mm. It makes in no the sense. same pile. It makes no sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it makes yeah, no absolutely. sense. Absolutely. Look, so fingers crossed that things don't continue to get worse. Uh, but at the same time, I'm not super bullish on this. And again, like what we're saying, you know, for, for the last year or so is that really focusing on the basics, really focusing on actually having a really healthy business with really strong foundations. That's, you know, getting your margins right, you know, making sure that you're not discounting too heavily, making sure you get your inventory holding right. And that's one which, you know, I'm, I'm, I see this more and more of just like so many brands just sitting on just, just like when you're sitting on 50, 60% C grade inventory, that's a really tough position to be in. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we're going to move on to some other news, which are probably no less positive, um, no more positive, I should say, in that Allbirds, uh, who we talked about a little while ago for actually being a bit of a leader in the D2C space. And I remember when about when Allbirds first came into the scene, I feel it was like it was about maybe 10 years ago or so now, yeah. um, or however long, they were, they were a revelation. They were an absolute revelation in the footwear space, and they made so much noise. Because first of all, the shoes were distinct. They were fugly as hell, but apparently they were ridiculously comfortable. Yeah, you know, they were made out of the pure merino wool. They were better for the environment, all this stuff. They were unique. They were exciting. They were different. They became like the it shoe in Silicon Valley. I remember walking around the Uber office and going, what the hell are you people wearing on your feet? <laughs> when I was working there, it's like, oh, these all birds. It's like, oh, why would you want to wear those? But then after I left Silicon Valley, after I left San Francisco, I was like, oh, God, I've, got to, I've got to get myself a pair. I never you got drank, around you drank to buying the Kool Aid. <laughs> yeah, I, I did drink the Kool Aid. I never got around to buying the pair. Um, but I did see them continue to grow. And obviously, a few years ago, they had their IPO and their IPO had a phenomenal jump. Um, so I can't remember the exact numbers anymore, but it was a huge jump. It was something like almost like a 70% pop, I think, from the, uh, from the IPO price. But now year on year, that has now declined. They've lost about something like 85% in value from there. And the hits just keep on coming for them. With recently, you know, they've uh, they've replaced their CEO, um, yeah. and they've also embarked upon their turnaround plan, which actually saw a recent recall of a redesign of their popular, their most popular model, which they decided to redesign. They ended up having to to run some manufacturing and design issues with that, and had to go back to the drawing board. So something around like the sock inside the uh, the shoe not fitting properly, which meant that it was uh, it was not as comfortable as they would have liked. So this is a brand which I wonder whether they've just, like Icarus, they've just flown too close to the sun. I, I know you like your 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 history. Um, so like like Icarus, Greek mythology, have they, yeah. Greek mythology, have they flown too close to the sun? Like have they just tried to bite off more than they can chew for what is extensively a pretty niche product? Yeah, look, um, to continue that kind of metaphor, I think pride definitely comes before a fall. Um, I think they... <laughs> maybe rested on the laurels a little bit too bit too much i mean from my memory they were pretty much the first in the space really championing the sustainability side of things 
Um, and that was one of their big calling cards um, when no one else in, in that kind of, you know, runner, sneaker, you know, sector was really able to do it effectively. Um, I think they've had a lot of competition over the last kind of three or four years with New Balance and the rest of them bringing out sustainable lines. Um, yeah. And maybe they just haven't invested enough in learning and development and new products um, or not effectively if that product recall is anything to go by. But, um, yeah, it seems like maybe that they concentrated on a physical store rollout potentially, which is maybe the wrong area considering COVID had happened um, and maybe just not on not on the right areas of the business. But, but yeah, what are your thoughts? Look, I think that... What they had was never really a sustainable competitive advantage, first of mm. all. Because like you said, something like sustainable shoes made out of eco-friendly materials, et cetera, like other brands can do that. Other well, you know, better equipped, um, highly regarded shoe brands like a Nike or a New Balance or whoever can go in there and make shoes out of sustainable eco-friendly material. And they are doing that already. You know, matter of fact, Nike has a whole line of shoes which are made out of, totally made out of waste. Um, so um, uh, shoes which were previously bound for landfill, which is arguably as good or better for the environment than having merino wool. Mm. Then there's the issue about the fact that merino wool shoes are themselves fairly unique as well. Like how mainstream could they be? Uh, because they look different. They do look very different. And I would also not say they don't necessarily make you look when you put on clothes or you wear shoes. Like I've got a lot of Nikes, right? Like I've got a lot, wear a lot of Nikes. That's all, pretty much all I wear. But when you're wearing clothes or shoes or things like that, they're a status symbol. You know, you're meant to wear them to say something about yourself. Like you yeah. are this sort of person. And while there was that initial hype around the fact that, yes, if you, if you work in the valley and, and things like that, you should wear all birds. For the average punter on the street, I don't think they look at merino shoes and go, they make me 20% sexier. No, yeah. You know, it's kind they, of they like- are, They're probably your dad's shoes, right? Yeah. They look like dad's shoes. A little bit, yeah. There was, I think, a bit of a resurgence of them on the northern beaches when I used to live there, but but yeah. <laughs> but I think that, I mean, it could just be a little bit of a, uh, not like, do you remember Ke um, do you remember Tom's, the Esper Tom's, yes. Yep. Yeah, maybe like a similar kind of vibe. They, they went on the kind of you buy one pair, they give another pair to someone in a third world country. Mm. Um, they were the it shoe of like the early 2010s. And I'm kind of showing, my, yep. showing my age now. Um, <laughs> but yeah, and I, have ne I haven't seen Don't them worry. in years. You're still younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> but I haven't seen them in years. But incredible, incredible success for a short period, a shortish period of time. They're obviously still around. I think you can still buy them. You just don't you can, see them. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think Tom's again, like they didn't try to be more than they what they were. Like Tom's just focused on the fact that you know we're Tom's. You buy a pair of shoes from us, we donate a pair of shoes to someone in need. That's a yeah. really simple proposition. They never went out and said that our shoes are going to revolutionize the entire shoe industry. They've got pretty comfortable shoes. I probably wouldn't wear a, wear a pair of Tom's, but you get comfortable shoes which do good for the planet, which do good for someone else. That's a pretty easy to understand value proposition. Whereas all birds were trying to compete, I feel, in a space where they were really going after like really premium shoes. Like all birds aren't cheap shoes. They're actually relatively mm. expensive shoes. You know, and then they tried to move into other areas from like the, um, I can't remember what the, uh, let me just quickly look it up. Like their, their flagship all birds model, I believe is the original one was, was a the tree runner, I think, um, is a, is a pretty decent shoe. Then they started to try to move into more active shoes, you know, as well, like more, um, so the tree runner was, was the original one. Then they started to try to move into performance shoes. And that's where I started to think that they just tried to stretch everything a little bit too far mm. you know, and trying to move these kind of shoes into an area which they potentially weren't well suited for and i think part of that it was driven by the fact that when you're a public company you there's so much pressure on you to grow like you need to show a growth in shareholder value each and every earnings call every quarter you need to show some sort of growth and that puts pressure on a business like this which is really just like a one hit wonder right yeah. to kind of come up with different ways to be able to innovate and enter new categories and enter new markets and things like that so let's do bricks and mortar let's do you know, let's do bricks and mortar let's do running shoes let's do these kind of shoes let's do da 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 and you end up stretching it too far 
when really, if they just stuck to being that single shoe, which it looks like Tom's has, Tom's still has like primarily only the one silhouette when it comes to their shoe. And Not they just sure do that how, really, how really well. Not sure how much you can revolutionize an espadrille, but hey, I'm sure there's someone out there, you know, yeah, take exactly. that idea and run with it, literally. Yeah. But. But you look at Crocs, right? Like Crocs is like a multi-billion dollar business, the fastest yeah. growing apparel brand in Australia in the last 12 months. It's the same shoe, but in different silhouettes. It's the exact same thing. Yeah. So yeah, do you so think they, they, they IPO'd too, do you think they IPO'd too early then? Uh, potentially, but I also think they shouldn't have IPO'd. Mm. Like, I, I understand that it's frothy. You've got investors. Investors do want you to be able to, you know, show a return for that. So we're going to, you know, they're going to push you towards that IPO event because that's the most common event where they can actually exit and get, get some sort of return for their investment. I get that. But at the same time, as soon as you start taking that VC money, it puts pressure on you to do things which you may not necessarily have wanted to do, you know, in the first place. Uh, um, Reddit recently. Are, are you a Reddit user, Arabella? <laughs> I'm not, but my my partner is a prolific Reddit user. So excellent. I kind of by, pro- I. by proxy, I am. <laughs> <laughs> so Reddit had an opportunity to IPO a couple of years ago, and they chose not to. They chose to stay private um, rather than IPO, and that actually allowed them to kind of miss the bloodbath of the last couple of years, where you saw a lot of the tech stocks um, from like 2021, which went public, have now like had the most insane of crashes since then and only a few of them like the behemoths like the alphabets and the metas etc have been able to pull themselves out of it but for the most part a lot of those other stocks like snapchat and pinterest for instance have been absolutely smashed from Mm. that period whereas reddit made the decision to not ipo and just focus on consolidating the business model cleaning up what they were offering so reddit have done a really great job i feel in terms of getting rid of a lot of the, the negativity on the platform and now they've just recently IPO'd and their stock was up 60% on day one. And yes, it's kind of like fallen back down in the last, uh, in since, since trading after that, but they're still trading at about 40% higher than their IPO price, which is a really, really strong sign, you know, for them. And, and, and probably evidence that, you know, that they're a, a better run business and a better, a business with better potential than Snapchat, et cetera. But also that the market also kind of come back. So kind of going back to the point about all birds is that all birds potentially IPO'd too early because when the wheels started falling off the market and they couldn't show that consistent growth, the market's now smashing them. Whereas mm-hmm. if they'd actually decided to hold back for a little while, stayed pu- private for a little while, they could have avoided that additional scrutiny, figured out what the growth model is to continue to innovate beyond the tree runner rather than being put in a position by the markets that they just needed to find a hit and you just end up just throwing a lot of things out faster than you should trying to find that next you know hit to be able to create more shareholder value to pump up your stock price etc yeah i think that's a good as summary as any but yeah i would agree <laughs> with you <laughs> All right, Arabella, we are now going into our last story of the day, which is a pretty significant one uh, because it's one which happens every year and one of my favorite reports because at Retail Fest, they always introduce this one um, and it's a great report. Uh, We've got our early hands on on a copy of this. It did come out publicly last week in that Australia Post have released their 2024 Inside Australian Online Shopping e-commerce industry report. That is a mouthful. So this report is uh, is a study of both businesses and consumers in Australia. It's probably the most significant study uh, into this sector. Uh, and we'll, we'd love to get your thoughts. Uh, if, if, first of all, have you had a chance to read it? And second of all, whatever, uh, yeah, what, what, what are your key takeaways from it? Look, it's always a good read. I'm going to sound like a real loser saying, but um, it is always a good read every year. Anyone listening um, to the podcast probably would also think it's a good read, so <laughs> you're in good company. Thank God. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, it's it's always a good read. Um, I think the key takeaways from this one were, were certainly, and I'm looking at particularly my cohort of, of demographic, my generation, is how clearly the cost of living crisis is affecting spending habits. Um, so for Gen, what am I, Gen Z and a millennial, those two segments. Um, yeah, don't pause they, too much and don't shake. Oh, no, yes. you should shake. You should shake and pause. <laughs> the millennial pause and the Gen Z shake, Gen X shake? I don't know. Yeah, the, the, the Gen Z shake. I, I, well, I only discovered what these things are. 
and all the I'm, Gen I'm Z still, I'm members of the team are like, I've, who I've the hell are you? Done, <laughs> yeah, I've probably done a few millennial pauses um, throughout this podcast. But anyway, um, yeah, so I think that that was a, an obvious takeaway, um, but clear, clearly reflected in that. Um, I guess the other key, key takeaway around the demographic side of things that were that the older demographics, boomer generation, um, is spending more or, or at least um, spending buying more frequently than they were previously. So that's two kind of interesting takeaways that I had. But yeah, yeah 7% the, I mean, year on year growth for uh, yeah. for baby boomers. Yeah. Um, the other, I guess, area that was interesting to see um, and maybe a little bit of a warning sign um, was that the two states with the highest, the biggest metro areas, essentially Vic and New South Wales actually fell in terms of spending, I think. That's mm. the statistic um, where the other states grew. Um, so I think overall it was like just about 1% evening it out. Um, but New South Wales and Victoria and ACT all were down year on year. I wonder whether those, and I, I saw the same thing as well, but I wonder whether those three are because of people leaving those states, you know, particularly those cities, right? leaving the Possibly. capital cities, moving into more regional areas, um, or in the case of Canberra, like, I don't know what they're doing if they're leaving Canberra, probably going back home. Um, but in terms of just like just people moving out of those areas, but by looking at the trend though with the baby boomers, like you're seeing that 7% year on year decline. Part of that I was looking at going like, is that because they're just becoming more comfortable with buying online as well? They, as buying yeah. online has become more and more mainstream with things like Amazon, um, you know, also department stores like David Jones and et cetera, also having stronger online offerings now, they just become more comfortable with it. And they just, yeah, because I know my mum, yeah. who's 76 years old, she, she's very comfortable buying online now. <laughs> but the other thing is that Gen Z spending, though, has declined. So while you've got baby boomers increasing their spending because they're the most resilient through this period, of course, mm. Gen Zs, who are probably the ones who've been arguably hit the hardest because they've got the lowest wage growth, um, you've got yeah. slow wage growth, and they're also making less than other generations, feeling the effects of the current economic crisis more feeling that pressure more than other age groups <laughs> i mean it's, i think it's a sweeping statement obviously but um you know i think you're right i think um that the boomer generation is becoming more comfortable in terms of shopping online and i think that they have potentially if they're a long-term home homeowners maybe not been as affected as you know younger generations with home loans and you know mortgages and business loans etc um that they may have been able to somewhat of avoid some of the cost of living pressures that the younger generations are facing um so yeah i think i think it's kind of two sides of the same coin essentially um mm. but yeah still interesting statistics coming out of that as usual now there was a another one which was the emergence of the strategic shopper <clears throat> which i thought yeah. was very interesting in that it's showing that our buying behavior has also changed as well. A lot of retailers listening to this podcast would probably have noticed that their AOV has probably dropped quite a bit. And when you look yeah. at trends, and I do, I do a lot of audits, so I look at a lot of Shopify accounts, <laughs> as you do, you can clearly see that when you chart like the last two years, it's just been like a steady decrease. And that's reflected in this report where in the study, like AOV has dropped by, well, average basket size has dropped by 4.6% year on year, which is, but at the same time though, people are buying more often as well. So the finding from this is that we're now moving into more of a strategic mindset that as people become much more confident with buying online, that they're becoming much more mindful and value driven as well. So they're purchasing less, but more frequently. So actually being much more thoughtful of what they're buying, being less concerned about just buying up big at certain times, but just thinking like, okay, well, I'm buying what I need when I need it at the right price, which is a yeah. very interesting one. It is interesting because on the, in the same report, it, we, it was also talking about how many businesses have stopped shipping for free. They're now mm. charging um, for shipping. So it's interesting that the frequency has gone up. You would kind of expect that, you know, if you're paying for shipping now, then you'd try and consolidate. <laughs> Your shipping cost, like your, your number of kind of shipments, but it's interesting. I mean, it's good um, for businesses who are obviously kind of, in, I guess, increasing the average order value or trying to keep that average order value at mm. some kind of manageable level with shipping, putting in shipping costs. 
Yeah. Um, I think it's good for us in terms of sustainability-wise as well. Um, and same with free returns or, or abandoning free returns and charging for returns as well. So um, there were some good stats around that. But I think that, I mean, I think that makes sense. It's certainly um, I'm not as buying as friv- frivolously as I used to a couple of years ago. I was a little bit tr- trigger happy on the add to cart during COVID, but um, I'm certainly being a lot more mindful of not only how much I'm spending, but who I'm spending it with. Mm. Um, so really by making sure that, you know, what I do buy is really good quality, it's going to last, um, not that kind of, not around that fast fashion or kind of impulse impulse, impulse purchasing, I guess. Um, mm. I've still got clothes in my closet from COVID that have tags on. So <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's an example of uh, <laughs> being a little bit too impulsive with my with my spending habits during, during I, the glory I, days. <laughs> I, I did that as well. I definitely threw a lot of active wear. A lot of active wear through COVID. It's like, <laughs> I'm, I'm not really going to the gym, but I'm still buying a lot of active wear. I don't know why. And I worked for an active wear company at the time as well. Um, yeah, because the sustainability one is very interesting because, again, yet again, I think this is like three or four years running now, that it continues to show that shoppers, like 62% of shoppers this year anyway, were willing to pay extra for products that align with their values, particularly when it came to sustainability and things like that. And it's one of those things where I keep seeing this, that statistic, but I don't feel it. Like the data mm-hmm. is telling me that it's this, but my my heart – is that right? The head is telling me something, but my heart is showing me something completely different. And I just don't feel that we're making that shift enough because I continue to see the the continued rise of like the Timus and the Sheehan's and people yeah. just chasing for like the cheapest possible products. You know, my, my 13-year-old daughter, like she loves Sheehan. That's all she wears. I, it, it breaks my heart. It really breaks my heart to see that. Um, so it was great that, you know, that, that, that your that your behavior is already there. But do you think that this is something which is is poised to actually become mainstream this year, that people actually start making more conscious decisions as shoppers? I think so. I mean, I really I applaud France for um, mm-hmm. putting in that law or policy or whatever they have done recently um, on fast fashion. I think to their credit, the kind of younger generations are a lot more clued up about sustainability and they'll call you out on it as well um i mean not just you know companies but also each other in terms of uh, definitely seeing more of a rise in that reselling or circular economy in terms of clothing and accessories um i think there'll always be a place for the sheens of this world unfortunately or fortunately for those who love it um because it's necessary for some you know for some people who just can't afford it you know, and they just, you know, want to enjoy it, but can't afford it. That's fine. That's a, the, that's the place for them. Um, but yeah, it's interesting about the kind of paying for sustainability. I know when I was at a furniture company a few years ago, we did market research and um, they're kind of, were very, are still very much leaning on the sustainability side of things. Um, but the market research came back as sustainability is great, but we don't really want to pay any more for it. Mm. Um, which is interesting. So, I mean, I think there is, there is a gradual shift there, but I think to your point, it's more of a more more and more of an expectation rather than um, one like rather than a feature that you know you're bit, you're forcing me to pay for. Um, seems to be like the attitude I feel of the market. They they expect it rather than they'll pay for it. So mm. so yeah yeah, it'd be interesting. I mean I, I do hope we we do move away from the fast fashion. I, I'm kind of more of a believer in the buy less buy well, but. Well, that actually kind of goes into another trend, um, the, uh, the the rise of pre-loved marketplaces. Yeah. So a lot more people like embracing shopping at pre-loved marketplaces is something which uh, I was I was only looking for um, on on a Facebook buy nothing page just before <laughs> I jumped on this to try to find a bookcase. I'm like, well, oh, like, do I don't really want to buy a new bookcase? Maybe just find one and buy nothing. You can buy you can find some good little finds on Facebook Marketplace. Exactly. I've definitely yeah found a good. Kind of get a couple of couple of things on there mm. for sure, but yeah. yeah, I've got loads of friends who kind of resell their you know like designer gear and um, not on Facebook Marketplace but on the other ones which could completely escape my memory now. But um, loads of people do it. Like I was quite surprised that how many of my friends are are on there just selling their old jeans that they can't fit into anymore because they've had kids and yeah. <laughs> Yeah, fantastic, and also AI as well. It wouldn't be it would be remiss of a twenty twenty four outlook report not to have AI. But yeah. one in three e commerce brands reporting that they're starting to use AI in their operations. So if you're not using AI already, 
first of all, you sh should be. Second of all, call us and we'll tell you how you can use AI in your <laughs> business if you're not using it already. Um, or if you come to Retail Fest, Paul and I will be talking about this quite, uh, quite at length and I'm going to be covering this off in my workshop on the, uh, on the Tuesday. I wonder how many, for how many businesses the AI tool they use is just ChatGPT. Probably oh, quite a few. <laughs> you, you can get away with a lot just with ChatGPT. It is an That's extremely true. powerful very tool. very true. Yeah. It is true. All right, Arabella, that is all we have time for. Uh, awesome. Anything more to add for our listeners before we, uh, before we wrap it up? No, that's it for me. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me Fantastic. on. Fantastic. Great to have you here. It's been an absolute blast having you on the call, uh, Arabella. Uh, in the meantime, you can see Arabella at Retail Fest. If you're not heading up there already, what are you thinking? Make sure that you go to the <laughs> Retail Fest website, check it out. I believe that the hosted program is still available. If you'd like to join that, um, you can get $800 towards your flights and accommodation to stay on the Gold Coast for three nights to check out Retail Fest one of the leading retail and e-commerce conferences in Australia. It's been a pleasure. This week in e-commerce, I'm now Chia. Next week, we should have Paul Waddy back. But if not, Arabella may be joining us again. Maybe so, it'll be a regular stay. <laughs> <laughs> have a great week, everyone. See you guys. Bye.